Merry Christmas. Uh, I don't know uh, what kind of Christmas Eve you had. Uh, I had a very quiet Merry Chris, uh, Christmas Eve, uh, and just feeling very, very thankful and blessed to be here, uh, especially uh, to deliver uh, the message of Christmas on Christmas Day on Sunday. I don't know when was the last time it falls on uh, Sunday like this, but uh, it's wonderful to share and, and, and wonderful to see all of you. For those of you who are joining for the first time, we're doing Christian Foundation Series. Uh, Word of God is a foundation. Without it, you do not stand. Your life do not stand. Right? And this is the fourth message on uh, the topic of Word of God. And you know, you know something for those of you who are joining for the first time? Jesus' name is the Word of God. Did you know that? Revelation chapter 19. His name, the person of Jesus, his name is the Word of God. Okay? So with that as an introduction, um, Isaiah chapter 9 has that famous prophecy about coming of Jesus. And I ask you to take a look at this. Okay? For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And look at this now, how it turns around. It's a baby, it's a child, but he's called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who is this? This baby right here. Okay, this baby Mario. Does that make sense to you? Okay, to us a child is born and son is given. Okay, and the government or dominion or rule and authority is upon his shoulder right here, the baby. And his name is, is he will be called four things, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And I ask you to think with me whether this makes sense or not, okay? Because if he is wonderful counselor, uh, another meaning is wondrous potter, okay? You know that story of potter and clay? He is the potter. He's sovereign. And he became a baby, right? And what about mighty God? Is baby mighty? Does that make sense at all? That's not an adjective you use for a baby. He's a mighty baby. You can't, you can't do that. Mighty God. Become a baby. How about everlasting father? Does that make sense? Someone who is everlasting, born into time and space? Does that make sense at all? Think with me. Right? What about prince of peace or chief or captain of shalom? Okay? He's coming into the enemy territory, right, to bring peace as a baby, naked. Does that make sense at all? You, come, you go to enemy territory naked as a baby? It just does not make sense at all, right? But that's the prophecy of Christmas. What is Christmas about? Christmas is about what God has planned from eternity past to come to a fruition, God becoming a man. Okay, that's what Christmas is about. You know, we have all these different misconceptions, I would say, or derivatives of Christmas. Christmas is about exchanging gifts. It's about reindeers or cookies, turkeys. Wow. It's all good, but it is really about Christ. And who is Christ? Amazingly, he's called Wonderful Counselor, Wondrous Potter, and you are the clay. And he came, he's coming into be with the clays. Does that make sense? Right? And he is the mighty God. And he's almighty God, all powerful, all knowing, and just all powerful, and he becoming a baby. Right? And then uh, everlasting father. You know, we're going to look at this today. Uh, what's everlasting? Right? From eternity past to eternity future. That's everlasting. And he come into a time and space, a place called Bethlehem, right, 2,000 years ago, uh, 
and becoming, coming as a baby, everlasting father, and prince or the captain of shalom, peace, right? It's amazing. When, when I think about that, it's an amazing thing. You don't go to an enemy as a baby. You don't send a baby to an enemy territory. But he is the one who brings peace and reconciliation. Through him, all things are reconciled. That's the gospel, isn't it? Okay. Today's text, uh, Nick read uh, from John chapter 1. I have decided to use this as a text today because Jesus is the word of God. That's his name. And John chapter uh, 1 is very unique because uh, it speaks about this person, the Word. Okay, the Word. Do you know Him? Okay, do you know Him? And I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, speaking down on you. No, I'm just asking you, right? Do you know uh, the person of the Word? And I have decided to use just two, uh, two verses, 1 and 14, skip everything be, uh, in between. Okay, John chapter 1, 1 speaks about who is this man? Who is Jesus? Right? And John chapter 1, verse 14 speaks about why Christmas? Okay, so we want to th think about two, two, two things. Who is this and why? Right? So John chapter 1, let me begin. Who is Jesus? He, uh, it, says, it begins with Three clauses, okay? In the beginning was the Word. It's the person. The Word is the person. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Just three clauses. Probably uh, most compacted, you know, biblically, theologically, you know, everything. It's just a loaded sentence. But who is Jesus? Okay, let me begin with the first clause, in the beginning was the Word. What does that sound like? What do you uh, remind you of in the beginning? Obviously, it's, the, uh, it's reminiscent of the first book of the Bible. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. I think John the author, through the inspiration of Holy Spirit, he intentionally started uh, like this. In the beginning was the Word. So the Word is the person, okay, you, you need to hang on. We're talking about Jesus as the Word, but I'm just going to continue to call him the Word. The person was in the beginning, and he began to create, which means he existed before Genesis 1-1, right? Think with me. Wake up. I know you had a long night, Christmas Eve. In the beginning, the Word was there, and he created. You don't Boom! Come into existence and start creating. You don't do that. Pre-existent nature of Jesus, if you will. How long ago? How much before Genesis 1-1? Eternity passed. Think with me. How long is that? Eternity passed. Okay? So, who is Jesus? He is pre-existing God. And second clause says, and the word was with God. He hung out with God the Father. Okay? It's, it means he coexisted, not only pre-existed, but coexisted with God the Father. Okay? So when we say he was with God, uh, it's not just talking about he kind of hang out there. It literally means he was with the Father God face to face in loving relationship. Could you picture with me? Right? having face-to-face -face in relationship with God from the eternity past. This person of the Word that we are going to talk about for Christmas existed in loving relationship with the Father God as a son from eternity past. Okay, And the last clause, who is Jesus? And the Word was God. Everyone, could you look at this clause? Okay, yeah, let's focus. Okay, the Word is God. Who is He? Jesus is God. In other words, this is the clearest, most direct in the entire scripture stating that Jesus is God. Do you see it? Okay, so if you summarize who is Jesus, basically three things He was before the creation, He pre existed. 
Like, Genesis 1-1 is not where he came into being, right? Not only he preexisted uh, Genesis 1-1 and creation, so he's the creator, and he also coexisted in loving fellowship with the Father forever, right? And not only that, boom, it lays out the, the final statement, he's God. He's God, okay? So that's who Jesus is, okay? So why Christmas? That God, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And why is it in this one verse, okay? If you could just look at, look at it. That Word, who was in the beginning, was with God, and the word, that God Word became flesh, meaning He became a man. That's Christmas. If you begin to put your mind into it, there is no greater event in history, if you think about it. If Jesus is God, and he became a man, he came into this existence of history, could there be any greater, greater, greater uh, event? My, me going to medical school, right? Get, me just getting married. I mean, those are important things. But let's put, this, put things into perspective. If God became a man, why? Right? Why? Here's why. So that he may dwell. First, he may dwell among us. Second, we will see his glory, the glory of, of one and only Son from the Father. And third, the grace and the truth. So I want to talk about why Christmas. Three things. Number one, so that he may dwell among us. So that he may live and tent among us. Second reason, so that we may see his glory. If you see the glory, do you remember? In the Old Testament, if you see the glory, your life will change. It'll change. It'll just forever change. And third, demonstration of grace and truth. Okay, so let me begin. Okay, first, why Christmas? Number one, he dwelt among us. Okay, he lived among us. You live with your family, right? You live with, uh, you know, precious people in, 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 in life. Your spouse, your children, right? But you don't live with Mr. Trump. You don't, right? Although he's going to be the president of this country in, I guess, in a few days, right? You don't live with him. But Jesus, God, became a man so that he may dwell with you. Okay? That's a pretty mind-boggling thing if you think about it. But the word dwell, uh, the original word is skeno. And uh, it, it, it means live in a tent, okay? And right away, you probably think of uh, Old Testament. In the, uh, uh, in the Old Testament story, when Israelites were wandering in the desert, where, where did God uh, reside? It was in the tent, right? Tent of meeting. Later developed into tabernacle. Can you look up here? Yeah, let's look up, please. Okay? Dwell means live in a tent. But the uh, Hebrew word for dwell is shakan. Sounds similar, doesn't it? And the interesting thing will spin out from here. The word shakan sounds like what, what word? Shakaina. Do you, you know that word? Shakaina. Glory. Dwell means glory. Right? In the presence of God, there is glory. Jesus God came to us, became a man, so that his presence and glory may be with us. Now, if you remember, in the Old Testament, you cannot go to God. You can only go, through, uh, go to God with what? With the blood. Right? Why? Because He's holy. Because any sin you try to approach God, you know, God will consume you. So you have to come with blood, which means death. Right? Only through the blood you could go to holy God. And we human beings couldn't go to God in the Old Testament. When it comes to New Testament, that's why that God, holy God, came to us so that through His blood that we may go to Him. I'm, 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 I'm hoping that you could get this, okay? This is like a, a gospel in a nutshell. In the Old Testament, you go to God and you stand, you'll be consumed, literally consumed. You'll be burned and you'll be destroyed because he's holy. 
We can't go to Him. But He came to us so that His blood, through His blood, we could go to Him. That's what dwell means. Okay? It's a pretty a significant, incredible meaning. Secondly, the glory. Okay? When we have seen His glory, I don't know what uh, image comes to your mind, but I'm sure you all have image when you hear the word uh, glory. Can I just ask youth uh, group, in your mind, when you hear the word glory, what comes to your mind? Something comes to your mind, right? Not what, what comes to your mind? Hmm? God is standing. Light. Beautiful. God standing. And you're standing before God, and the light shines. You should think about things like this. Because glory is a key theme in the Scripture, right? God is glorious. We know that, right? And He's, he's the light. And He came so that He may show His light, okay? Um, you go to Hebrews chapter 1, if you could just uh, stay with me. Very interesting, okay? There's a very concrete, significant meaning of Jesus coming into this world. Christmas is stated in Hebrews chapter 1, okay? Long ago, all this time, many times, in the many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Old Testament, it was always through the prophets. Prophecies, the word of God, right? But in these last days, right now, he has spoken to us by his son okay he has spoken to us by his son whom we appointed heir of all things meaning he's the he's the ruler of everything he's the lord of all right through whom also he created the world he's the creator right and here's the word here's the sentence jesus is the radiance of god's glory he's the radiance actual radiance of god shining and the next sentence says, and also the exact imprint of his nature. In other words, if you look at NIV, it says exact representation of who God is. Can you, can you think with me? God, we cannot really can fathom with our finite mind. He became a human being, not in 30%, 40% in capacity, if you will, but in full capacity, exact representation of God came as Jesus. That's what it, that's what, that's what it means. Okay? I don't know uh, whether that excites you or not, but if you think about it, it's an amazing statement because what it is saying is Jesus is exactly the same as God, and he came as the glory glorious Shekinah, so that he may dwell among us. And here's a more, more crazy thing, and he lives, lives within you. That's what the gospel says. He lives within you. Okay? Jesus is the Shekinah of the presence of God, exactly same intensity, okay? Light of God. How strong is it? Same intensity. Jesus, same intensity. Same magnitude, same penetra penetrability. I don't know, I made up that word. Okay. Same warmth, same everything. Jesus. And he became a man. Okay. So let me summarize. Jesus is the glorious, your kind of God who speaks, and his name is the Word of God. Listen to me. If you don't uh, treasure the Word of God, his name is the Word of God. And he is the incarnate living word of God. He's alive right now. He's a living word, right? And he's the final word. If you want to know what the end is about, what, what is the truth, you got to listen to him, according to the scripture. He's the final word. It's not what people try to figure out. It's not, because things change. But his word never change, right? And fourthly, he's the fulfillment of all the Old Testament and the New Testament. Literally. Why? Because Jesus is the word 
who is glorious. Okay? He's the Shekinah of the glory of, of glorious God. Uh, many people uh, kind of like directly and uh, indirectly over the last few weeks told me, you know, I really began to see the importance of word of God. I don't know whether you see it. Okay? I don't know whether you see it. And I'm, I was so encouraged because in 2016, this year, we only have a few days left, we started a Bible reading plan for the, uh, for the church. And I don't know how many people, but some people follow through and they're finishing up. Okay? For the first time in their life. They may have gone to church for 20, 30 years, maybe even 40, 50 years. And according to statistics, over 70% of the people never read the Bible once. Okay? Oh, he's talking about, you know, just reading the Word of God. It's more than that, of course. But I'm so thankful that many of you are finishing up the entire book from Genesis to Malachi, uh, 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 Revelation, for the first time in your life. And it's going to build some, some momentum in your life. I, I really believe. And it's going to build a confidence in your life as you begin to treasure as you begin to honor the Word of God. Are you finishing up, Nare? You are, right? I know she is. That's why I'm asking her. Yeah. Her father says, you know, she's like, the, she's like a priest at home, right? She doesn't budge. I, I heard from your dad. Yeah. That's a good thing. Good thing. Okay? When you begin to honor and treasure the Word of God, your life will change. You know why you need to do that? Week after week, I'm preaching, I'm closing up today, because Jesus is the final word. And if you don't know the final word, you don't even know where you're going. Basically, that's what it means. He's the fulfillment of everything. He's the living word, and he is the incarnate living word. He's everything, basically. Okay? And third and finally, uh, you know, I want to just think about these two words. How is Jesus' grace? How is Jesus the truth? Jesus said, I am the truth. Provocative statement, if you will. What do you mean, you are the truth? The person is the truth? Exactly. Okay? And I was meditating about this uh, this week. If you would just stay with me, okay? When he says Jesus, the word, is grace and truth, okay? Jesus is the grace. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the glorious grace, and Jesus is the glorious truth. How? Because Jesus shows what grace is. Will you think with me? Okay. Here's what I thought about. If Jesus is God, and he thought of me, that's grace. Stay with me. If Jesus is God, and he made a promise to me, and he kept it, and that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he has spoken to me, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he came to me and came to us, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he's with me, Emmanuel, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he dwelt among us and he abide in us, O man or, or with us, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he taught, he's teaching me and he has spoken his word to me and he has shown me the ways, that's grace, isn't it? If he's God. If Jesus is God and, and he encourages me and he rebukes me, rebukes me, that's grace, isn't it? Otherwise, I'll be a fool. I don't even know what is right and, and what is wrong unless he corrects me and rebukes me. If Jesus is God and he was taunted and ridiculed for me, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he's patient with me and he waits for me day after day after day, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he was beaten, mocked, pierced, and crushed for me, that's grace, isn't it? Are you listening? 
If Jesus is God and he forgives me, that's grace, isn't it? Do you forgive people? You have trouble forgiving people? If Jesus is God and he was completely undressed except undergarment and shamed, you don't like look funny before people, don't you? We are so sensitive about that, don't you? But he was completely undressed except one undergarment for me. That's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he bore, I can't even describe this, he bore all of my sins, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he bled for me and he died for me, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he was forsaken, by the Father who was coexisting from eternity past for me. That's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and went to hell for me, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he was raised and resurrected, gives me hope, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God and he's coming back for me to take me home to the Father, right? That's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God who never changes, that's grace, isn't it? Do you know anybody who never changes? If Jesus is God who is love, that's grace, isn't it? If Jesus is God, came for a wretch like me, that's what you need to see. That's grace, isn't it? You know why Jesus is grace? Because everything that he said and done is grace. If you put your mind into it. Do you agree? Do you? What about truth? Everything I said up to now, if you replace truth with, with uh, replace grace by truth, it is true. If Jesus is God and thought of me, that is the truth. If Jesus is God, made a promise with me and kept it with me, that is the truth. If Jesus has spoken to me and kept his promise, that's the truth. He came to me, that's the truth, right? He is with me. That's the truth, right? I know I'm going to take a little bit of time, right? He dwell among us and he abide and mano with us is the truth, right? He taught me, he's teaching me, spoken his word to me and he showed me is the truth. He encourages me and he rebukes me is the truth. He was taunted and ridiculed, yet patient for me is the truth. He was beaten, and he was mocked, and he was pierced, and he was crushed for me is the truth. And he forgives me is the truth. He was undressed and shamed like no one else. Although he's the mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, everything, his shame for me is the truth. Jesus is God and he bore all my sin is the truth. Right? Jesus bled and died for me is the truth. Okay? He was forsaken, although he's the son of coexistence for, from the eternity past. For me, it's the truth. It's the truth. And he went to hell. For me, it's the truth. He was raised and resurrected. It's the truth. It's not what you think. It's not what I think. It's the truth. 
right? And therefore, he is the hope of my life and your life is the truth. And Jesus is God and he's coming back. It's the truth. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It doesn't work like that. Right? That's the truth. He's taking us home. It's the truth. He's taking us to the Father, the real Father, right? It's the truth. And he never changes. It's the truth. He is love. It's the truth. I am a wretch. It's the truth. Yet he loves me. It's the truth. Why did he come? Show grace and truth to you. Christmas, Christmas is really about him. It really is about him. It's not even about me. It's not about me. It really is about him. Okay? Let's pray.